Namaste and greetings. I am Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti and Sandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi. Welcome you all to the IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talk. Today we have gathered for a talk under the series, The State of Foreign Trade hashtag Talking Trade, with Professor Takahiro Sato on global value chain participation of the Indian economy. This deliberation is being organized by the IMPRI Center for the Study of Finance and Economics. I feel privileged to introduce the chair for the session, Professor Mukul Asher. Sir is the former professor, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. We welcome you, sir. I am honored to introduce the speaker, Professor Takahiro Sato. Dr. Sato is a professor of the Research Institute for Economics and Business Administration at Kobe University. His areas of research are development economics and studies on the Indian economy. He has authored many books and articles which have appeared in the Journal of Policy Modeling, Economics of Governance, Oxford Development Studies, Economic and Political Weekly, Journal of Asian Economics, and European Journal of Development Research. In 2007, Sir received the first JSIS Award from the Japanese Association for South Asian Studies. We welcome you, Sir. We are fortunate to have Professor Dave Nathan and Professor Amita Batra as the discussants for the session. Professor Dave Nathan is an eminent economist and research director at Gen Dev Center for Research and Innovation, Gurgaon. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Professor Amita Batra is a professor at the Center for South Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Welcome, ma'am. We have with us Dr. Naleen Bharti as the moderator. So is the Associate Professor at Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. Welcome, sir. Now I invite Professor Usher to take the proceedings further and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pranam, Namaskar. May I thank, first of all, Impri to <clears throat> invite me and for organizing such an interesting seminar on a topic that is both relevant and timely. And what is impressive about the research on global value chain participation of the Indian economy is that uh, it has a lot of empirical research possibilities that we will see when the presentation is made by uh, Sensei Takahiro Sato-san. Uh, we know that the globally, we are undergoing a very dynamic and in somewhat uncertain change. We have a hegemon, US, which is being challenged um, by, by others. We had liberal world order for quite some time, few decades, and the global value chain analysis, concepts, data is when the liberal world order was uh, <clears throat> uh, fairly robust and thriving. But now we are moving towards somewhat more fragmented global political economy. There was a, a very interesting report that I suggest by Rabo Bank 
called the world in 2030, in which they looked at the economic, military, cultural, and other dimensions of power. And they project or they have scenarios about how different countries are going to react to this increasing fragmentation that we are uh, witnessing from the move away from liberal world order that prevail. Japan and India both are part of that uh, picture that the Rebo Bank uh, has nicely uh, sketched. One of the, the slogans that sort of captures this is that the, we are moving away from just in time, which was the Japanese concept of just in time manufacturing to just in case. So that we have now some uh, the different ways of adjusting to the dynamics of globalization. For India, that is uh, essentially uh, summarized by the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan and Be Vocal for Local initiatives. Globally, there are many variants of these two that the countries are trying. So what would be, what, what is a, I would call a research goldmine of GVA is how this GVA will play out in the coming years in both aggregate way and in a disaggregated way. Will those that were really uh, at the forefront of benefiting from GVA, for example, ASEAN-5 um, and Vietnam uh, in recent years, will they continue to uh, benefit or will we see a different patterns emerging uh, among, the, among the countries? Uh, and we have no better person than Sensei Sato-san from Kyo Universities to acquaint us, to educate us with the dynamics of the GVA. I very much look forward to the presentation. I will make some more comments after the presentation if I have the opportunities. So may I now turn over the session to the moderator, Professor Nalin Bharti, please. Yeah, thank you, Professor Asad. Uh, now I will uh, invite Dr. Sato to have his presentation. And uh, once his presentation will be over, then we will take up some of the questions. And also uh, I will request the chairperson to, to, uh, to speak a few points about uh, the presentation by, by Professor Sato. So uh, Professor Sato, uh, you can start your presentation now and then uh, we will take up some of the questions after that. So thank you very much for inviting me as the main speaker of this uh, uh, seminar. So I'm very, very happy uh, to be here for presenting my uh, research, Global Value Chain Participation of the Indian Economy. So I, start, I shared my slides with you. So, so can you see my slide? Yes, it's on. Yes, 
Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So I start. So this is a uh, uh, outline my uh, today's presentation. Uh, in the first two section, I'd like to explain my motivation of this uh, research. And then I investigate the GVC participation of the Indian economy at three levels. First level is macroeconomic and or international trade aspect. And the second level is related regarding to the micro level, firm level. And the third level is the uh, industry level. Final section, I uh, do uh, conclusion. This is an uh, uh, introduction. So I, um, I recognize the GVC as a driving force of economic development of developing countries. What is the GVC? GVC is the interdependence of value-added activity of numerous economic actors operating across national borders. This is a, a general definition of GVC. In today's global economy, uh, global firms play a central role in organizing the GVC. Participation and upgrading in GVC is critically important for the, for the economic development of developing countries. The terms and conditions under which Indian industry and firms participate in value creation at a certain stage of GVC in the chain like global economy are critical for industrial development and farm growth. Indian farms that are part of GVC has the opportunity to enhance their capability by learning the latest technology just, uh, just in time, like just in time, and management practice, uh, Kaizen activity in Japanese term. Farms that improve the, their capability will survive, while those that fail to improve their capability will be exit from the market. Through such uh, selection, the upgrading of the entire industry will be promoted, so which will lead to the development of the Indian economy itself. So before investigation of the GVC participation of the Indian economy, I would like to show you six figures to give you rough understandings. What is the GVC? So first slide is relating to the global location of Toyota, uh, major uh, auto companies based in Japan, 2012. So Toyota uh, ha had 50 uh, manufacturing units, including the, uh, each regional headquarters. Sometimes this kind of the uh, GVC network is called producer driven. This is a typical type of the uh, producer driven type of the GVC. Second slide is referred to the global location of Nike. So this uh, map shows the uh, global location of Nike production unit. Now uh, Nike has uh, 36 countries and 458 factories. And the Nike production unit employed more than 1 million workers in the world. So every day, Nike updates uh, this information. So this type of the GVC uh, network is sometimes called as the buyer's driven. So this is the GlaxoSmithKline's R&D location in the world. Many R&D centers uh, exist in the world. So we just look at the India. 
So global, in the global map, only three uh, urban D center. But if we look at the Indian homepage of GSK, we see so many urban D center in India. So India is a hub of the R&D in the uh, field of the pharmaceutical industry. And this is a TCS, global giant of IT firms in the world. So many uh, location they have. So what is a GVC? If we delete uh, the global, then we uh, get the value chain. So originally, uh, this value chain concept uh, developed by the Michael Porter, Harvard Business School professor. So we can see the sorry. Sorry, I missed it. So this value chain uh, has a several uh, stage. Uh, this stage is a very famous one, operations, branch operations, assembly, component fabrication. This is a production uh, stage, before production and after production. These kind of the uh, value chain stage as a primary activity. And also the uh, supporting activity, this one, procurement, technological development, human resource management, farm infrastructure. Then this, this uh, value chain uh, finally has some profit margin. Then uh, value chain generated the value in the world. So this concept is made by the uh, Michael Porter. Final figures is relating to the assembly uh, companies, Boeing, US based airplane companies. So, Boeing procure so many parts from the so many countries from US, from Canada, from Australia, Japan, Korea, EU. So, so many uh, parts uh, into the one. Uh, airplane. So this is a, a typical case of the uh, global production. So this is uh, my outline. I try to again uh, explain the, my uh, strategy of the, my research. Section two clarifies the trends and characteristics of GVC participation in of the Indian economy using World Bank. GVC statistical data. Section three identify the trends and characteristics of the GVC participation at the plant level in India's manufacturing sectors using unit level data of industrial statistics from the government of India. Section four summarize the existing studies on GVC using Indian industry and farms as case studies and confirms the result of the GVC research. Final section, summarize the list studies. Macroeconomic perspective. So I use the uh, data set from the World Bank. Recently, World Bank uh, released Global Value Chain World Development Report 2020 data. It is easy, easily available for any person. So I focus on the concept of the GVC-related output 
What is the GVC related output? This concept is developed by the World Bank Economist recently. GVC related output is the output of, the, of a country or sector which directly or indirectly cross more than one border. I think more than two border. <laughs> Not only uh, more than one border, uh, more than two border, at least two border. It provides a more general assessment of the amount of the production of each sector that is relating to GVC because it takes into amount the entire supply chain the sector participates to, regardless its direct involvement in export activity. So I use this concept, GVC related output per total output. So I uh, measure uh, this uh, amount of the GVC participation by using the World Bank data set. So I'd like to try uh, to explain uh, more explicitly the uh, concept of the GVC participation of ICE country. ICE country uh, in this context, please refer to India. I mean the India. I to J. I is a India. J is a Thailand, Indonesia, Pakistan, I don't know, China. I to J. I to J means export of ICE country to J's country. Please remember this uh, definition. Then I want to explain that what is the GVC participation in general? So ICE country, India. India import intermediate goods from H country. And then India in some industry uh, make some treatment to the, this intermediate input. Then uh, India uh, companies export the semi-product to J countries. So we can uh, output cross uh, H to I and uh, I to J, more than two, at least two uh, cross. So this is a GVC participation in general. Then GVC participation in general in can be decomposed into three factors, three components. First component is the pure forward participation, pure forward participation. So this is a, there is no import from any country. India uh, produce some intermediate goods based on their own resource. Then uh, India export intermediate goods to J countries. Then J country make some treatment to this uh, intermediate goods, then export to the K countries. So you can see more than two, uh, at least two uh, times uh, this output uh, cross the uh, uh, national borders. This is a pure forward participation. You can image this type of the GVC participation in the mining sector, mining sector. Iron ore, mangan, some coal. This kind of the uh, commodity uh, sometimes uh, can, uh, can be captured by this pure forward participation. Second concept is a pure backward participation. This is a very tricky case. This is a, a India a import some intermediate goods uh, from the H countries. And then India uh, export uh, final goods to final destination of J countries. Or India uh, export to some semi-product to J country. And inside J country, some countries, some companies in J country make some final goods. And uh, consumer in J country uh, consume uh, this final goods. Final destination is J countries. This is a pure backward participation. Final concept in the GBC participation is a two-sided participation. This is a very uh, general case, I think. So this is a very uh, simple way. Import 
and the export. Both activity are conducted by countries. Then World Bank economists uh, make the, this concept. Uh, then if we uh, summation one, two, three concept, then uh, equal GVC participation in general. Okay, what is a traditional trade? This is a GVC related output or a GVC participation. So what is a uh, traditional trade? as the GBC uh, trade analysis. This one, traditional trade. India, based, India just based on the, their own resource, then export uh, as the final goods. So this is a traditional trade. So there is no uh, relating to the uh, global production uh, network or the global value not there is no involvement global value chain. Only one cross the only one border, only. So GVC related output to, uh, from the point of the GVC related output, this kind of traditional trade is excluded. So this study focus of GVC participation in general and the GVC participation of engaging both import and export activity. So oh, in this case, uh, pure backward participation plus uh, two-sided participation. I combined two concepts in the following slide. Then I make some figures uh, to make uh, international comparison. How to the uh, stage, how to degree of the India's uh, GVC participation compared to the other countries? You can see the most uh, highly participated area economy is ASEAN 5 and uh, uh, Germany. You can see that from 1990s to the 2015s. Especially the uh, Germany case, very rapidly the uh, improvement of the GPC participation in Germany. So Germany and the uh, ASEAN 5 is the highest uh, level of the GPC participation economy. Okay, India. India is the same as Japan. Very similar uh, pattern. Uh, in the uh, Japan and India. Very, very low, very, very low participation compared to other countries. So China is here, China is here. Okay, so then I would like to check uh, the uh, India, China, ASEAN 5 only in the following this section. So this is a GVC participation of India, ASEAN 5, and China. This is a GVC related output to per uh, total output. So, okay, you can see that uh, ASEAN 5 is a very high and uh, uh, middle, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and the low, lowest one is uh, uh, India. So, and we can see some uh, trend from the 1990s up to 2008 uh, global financial crisis. So, we can see steadily improvement of the GBC participation in three economies. After 2008, uh, GBC participation becomes stagnant or decline. So, this is a, a common pattern in other, in other countries. So this is a uh, uh, GBC participation in terms of forward and backward GBC related output. Previous one, including the pure forward uh, GBC participation included. This uh, measurement to uh, exclude uh, the pure forward participation, but still same pattern in the previous figures. 
Then we can focusing only India. So all India uh, output into whole uh, broad uh, sector categories. One is agriculture. One is mining. One is manufacturing. Last one is a service. Four main uh, sector we can uh, decompose. Then we can see that agriculture and service sector, uh, the participation is very, very low. And the mining sector and mining sector is very high. And the uh, trend uh, is the same pattern in the total uh, GBC related output from 1919 to 2008, improving. After that, uh, stagnant or the decline. Then we uh, show the uh, forward and backward GBC related output, export and import pattern, both uh, pattern. Then we can see the most uh, highest, most highest level of the GBC participation sector is manufacturing sector in terms of the forward and backward GBC related output. So mining sector is uh, lower than the uh, manufacturing sectors because mining sector uh, had a lot of participation in terms of pure forward participation. So we can see the uh, different pattern uh, of uh, GBC participation in manufacturing sectors and ma mining sectors. Then we try to investigate the uh, GBC participation in manufacturing sector in detail. So we can uh, decompose the uh, whole main uh, sectors, subsectors or manufacturing sectors. One sector is uh, auto or sectors. Second is petrol, chemical and non-metallic product, and metallic product. And others, others including the textile, electronics, so many industry I include others. So we can see the uh, highest level of GBC participation sector is petrochemical non-metallic product. You can see that in Gujarat, very, very large uh, oil refinery factories managed by the reliance industries. So this is a typical case of the uh, five. Uh, petrochemical and non-metallic product, uh, such a high uh, participate in the global value chain. That's why one important factor is the uh, reliance oil refinery uh, uh, production unit. Then uh, metallic products. And uh, uh, I'm not sure, uh, to uh, 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 two different uh, series in the World Bank data set. So we, we cannot uh, identify the, uh, which is the uh, uh, real uh, situation, uh, the, especially other sectors. So I'm not sure due to the data problems. This is the same pattern, forward and backward. We focusing on the forward, backward GBC digital output. Still the same pattern in previous figures. Findings. First, India's level of participation in GBC is low in the world. Second, the degree of GBC participation in the mining and manufacturing sector is relatively high. In terms of the forward and backward GBC participation, Manufacturing sectors has highest level. Within the manufacturing sector, the degree of GBC participation is relatively high in the petroleum, chemical, and non-metallic industries. From 1990s to the global recession 2008, the degree of India's participation in GBC had been increasing. Since the global recession, GBC participation has stagnant except that of the metallic industries. Because 2000, 2010 uh, and 2011, 
コー,ルあー、ま、コールスキャンダル。コールスキャンダルハプニング。アフターザットがあインディアンあーコールセクター、クッドノットマインザーコール。そう、アフターザットザーメタリックインダストリー、スティールインダストリー、スターティックトゥインポートがエスペシャルコール、フロムダーフォーリンカントリーズ。I think this is the reason why、uh, the、uh, irrespective of the global recession, after the global recession, still、uh, GBC participation、uh, of steel industry、uh, increasing. Plant level perspective. I use the、uh, data from the、uh, annual survey of industry. So now, an annual survey of industries,、uh, unit level data are easily available on website. So I use 1997 and 2017 data, two data sets. Figures of two data sets are not comparable due to the change in the definition of register sector. 2015,、uh, registered definition of the registered sector is changed. From the uh, factory, uh, original uh, definition is the factory、uh, with power, if with power, then、uh, more than two,、uh, 20 uh, workers, then、uh, this factory must be registered under the Factory Act. But after 2015,、uh, factory、uh, with power and with、uh, 40、uh, workers. They must be、uh, registered under the factory act. So that's why、uh, these two figures are not、uh, comparable. So I can、uh, easily identify the、uh, four t y p e、uh, GVC participation by using the unit level data of the annual survey of industries. First type of the、uh, GVC participation. Uh, is plants without any international trade, no import, no export. Second is a plant、uh, with import only. Third is a plant with export only. Final plant. This is a very important plant for understanding the situation of the GVC participation of, of manufacturing sectors. Plants with both import and export. So, this is a type of the、uh, plants is very, very important for understanding the characteristics of the GBC participation in Indian formal manufacturing sectors. So, horse type of plant implies the forward and backward participation of GBC. But this、uh, concept is、uh, indirectly participation. So, we cannot identify the indirect r e participation. I can just identif identify the direct r e participation of the plant in, in the GBC. So, this is an estimated number of plants in the informal manufacturing sectors. So, in 2000,、uh, 1997,、uh, 70,000 uh, plants exist. Then, after 20 years,、uh, twice、uh, the volume of the twice, 1.5 lakh. So, you can see the、uh, wizard international trade percentage, import only and export only. Then, both import and export type of the、uh, plants, very small share of the total plants. So, this is a, a one. Very important characteristics.、Uh, directly,、uh, okay, the plant which directly、uh, forward and backward、uh, participate in the global value chain is very, very、uh, small. Small part of the total plants. Then I can、uh, some, uh, make some tabulation. tabulation. Based on the unit level data. Today, I just only the focusing on the 2000, 2017 data only. 
you can see that both import and export, how many percentage of the uh, both and export uh, the uh, located in rural area? How many uh, average year, average corporate years? These are 20. Census sector, 55 percentage. Holding capital share, how many percentage the holding capital participate in the each uh, categories? 50 percentage. Company share, company means uh, registered as a company and a company act. 74 percentage. This is a public enterprise share, only one percentage. This is a private uh, sector come company sector share, 73 percentage. This is a mostly uh, required more compliance. So public limited company share, 70 percentage. So you just look at the, this figure compared to the uh, without international trade. So huge difference. Uh, between the uh, without international trade type of the plants and uh, both import and export type of the plants. So I'd like to show the size, wage, and productivity. We can, we just look at the 2070 data. How many, uh, how many of these type of the uh, plants employees, total persons engaged, workers, without Asian traders, only 67, but both and export type of the plants, 460 uh, persons. Capital labor ratio, this is a rupee, uh, in terms of rupees, wage rate, and labor productivity, and total capital productivity. So both import and export to, uh, plants has much more size, much more wage, much more productivity. Technology. So internet to ISO 2000 uh, the, uh, refer to these data refer to the 1997. ISO uh, 14,000. And iron share refer to the 2017 figures. So you can see that uh, both import and export uh, adopt more advanced technology, more aggressively than other type of the uh, plants. So uh, how is the uh, involvement not uh, only global value chain? but also domestic value chain network. So it is very difficult to identify the involvement, the uh, network of global value chain. It is very difficult to identify, but uh, fortunately, fortunately, annual survey of industry uh, asks the company to the income from manufacturing and non-manufacturing service and payment for manufacturing and non-manufacturing service. So some scholar, some Indian and Japanese scholar uh, investigate uh, this kind of the subcontracting sub -contracting, uh, system of manufacturing sector by using ASI data. So just I use uh, this con concept in this context. So we can identify that without any subcontracting and subcontracting only, outsourcing only, both subcontracting and outsourcing. So both subcontracting and outsourcing can be recognized as the more involvement in the uh, domestic value chain network. So you can see that both 2017 data so both important export, the, uh, both subcontracting outsourcing share is highest compared to the other uh, type of the plants. 
So uh, this figure uh, shows that the more GVC participating uh, plants also involved in engaging in the domestic value chain network. And also I just look at the uh, location distribution of uh, GVC participating the uh, farm plants. But today I do, I consumed a lot of time for previous section. Just I uh, skip this figures. And also I can uh, make some figures from the uh, industry-wise distribution of the uh, GVC participating the plants. This time. But today we uh, skip this figures. Findings. The host type of plants which directly participate forward and backward in GVC has an organizational structure that requires greater compliance with laws and regulations, has a higher level of technology and a larger in size compared to other type of plants. This host type of plants has a higher percentage of subcontracting outsourcing and more involved in domestic value chain activities than other type of plants. There are significant difference in the distribution of industry and the location of the host type of plants. So I showed in the uh, explanation section four. Just I, uh, based on the literature review of GBC studies of the Indian industry. This is a strategy, empirical strategy. Google Scala, I uh, use Google Scala, global value chain, global project net network, global commodity chain with India as keyword. Development trajectory in global value chain series of Cambridge University Press and uh, GBC related books of OUP. Professor Devunathan edit uh, very good uh, books based on, on the GBC studies. Influential reports and working papers, ICRIEL and uh, ADBI, uh, Ministry of Finance. Research of GBC studies group headed by uh, Gary Jereffi. Dropping the paper appeared in predatory publishers and uh, macroeconomic and international trade analysis of GVC. Then I finally identified 50 papers and book on the GVC studies on the Indian industry. So you can uh, look at the list uh, which I identify uh, very important uh, influential and repeat very good papers and book on the GVC studies as case study of uh, using Indian industry. So summary of the GVC studies on the Indian industry. I uh, never look at this in detail, but uh, I uh, summarize. Then findings. Existing GVC studies that use Indian industry as a case study are biased towards uh, automobiles, IT, and pharmaceutical, three main industries, which has been successful in upgrading through GPC participation. This is a successful case studies. And also many studies on Indian agribusiness and textile garment industry has focused on social upgrading. Social upgrading is, what is that social upgrading? Labor condition, environmental sustainability, these kind of the subject uh, uh, studies in the, uh, as a social upgrading, very important uh, pet, uh, subject. Sometimes the income inequality. Although GPC studies has strengths in comparative analysis, I unfortunately find that uh, there are six papers make industry comparison and 13 papers that make industry comparison. The so author's expertise uh, cover a wide range of disciplines, including sociology, geography, anthropology, management science, economics, liberal studies, and engineering. GVC research is highly character characterized as an interdisciplinary collaborative research consists of various disciplines. Although the analysis terminology, analytical terminology is common according to the theoretical framework, uh, Gary Jereffi and his colleagues, concrete remarks, extent of GVC participation 
by the Indian economy's law compared to international standard. Firms participating in GBC are active in introducing advanced technology and the size and workers' wage are high. Firms participating in GBC also involve in participating in subcontracting system more aggressively. GBC research in India industry has been biased toward automobiles, pharmaceuticals, and IT. GBC studies on important industrial sectors such as oil refinery, where the degree GBC participation is very, very high, has not always been sufficiently conducted. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Soto. Uh, <clears throat> this was a very extensive presentation on India's uh, partnership in the GBC activities. Uh, now we have two discussions for this, uh, this talk. Uh, I would like to first invite Professor Dev Nathan for his remarks. So please unmute. Dev Nathan, so please unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nale. And thanks to Impri and to Professor Sato for a very interesting and wide ranging presentation. A couple of points come to me from the presentation. One is that Indian industry, not only that which is export oriented or in value in global value chains, but even that which is domestic in domestic value chains, according to the data, the ASI data he presented, clearly is getting more and more organized in value chains. So that the extent of outsourcing and subcontracting is growing. That means there is more and more specialization, which is what a value chain really is about. So that you specialize in certain tasks in which, well, you have certain core capabilities and competencies and therefore you outsource the rest. So that is the one point that struck me from his presentation. I think we generally know that this is happening, but it was good to see the data showing it that over a period of time, the extent of participation or organization in value chains through subcontracting and outsourcing is increasing. That was the first point which struck me. The second point is that the question of capabilities and uh, Professor Sato mentioned that there is an enhancement of capabilities when firms participate in global value chains. At one level, yes, it can be a certain, there can be a certain type of learning of production systems, which are more advanced and more efficient than those in say, for the domestic value chains. I have seen this in the case of the garment industry. If you visit some areas in Delhi, like Gandhinagar, which are the center of the domestic value chains, you will see a very haphazard, and you would wonder how they actually produce garments. You will see a very, what looks like a very haphazard and unorganized system of production compared to say the garment uh, export factories, which are around the area where I live, which is in Gurgaon. So there's a whole world of difference between the organization of production in domestic value chains and in global value chains. I remember asking one of the owners or managers of one of those domestic value chain producers of garments, why he did not move into producing for exports. And he said, well, for that, I need a completely different kind of factory. I would have to organize production in a very different way. So that is correct, that there is a very big difference in the manner in which production is organized for domestic and the global value chains, because you have to meet certain quality standards and the quality standards are not of that type when you work for the domestic manufacturers or for the domestic brands. That's the first point. Second is that, however, it's not as though there's a, uh, there's a kind of smooth enhancement of capabilities as you go 
along the value chain and upgrading. Now, what is the upgrading really to do with? The upgrading can be of two types. One is that you improve your own production facilities, but you remain a manufacturer. And the second is that you upgrade into, say, areas like design and marketing and brand branding, which are really the preserve and the monopoly of the global brands that are subcontracting to the Indian manufacturers or to other manufacturers around the world, not only in India. So the brands are happy if you upgrade and therefore reduce costs in the manufacturing segment of the value chain, but they do not like to share information or knowledge on the other segments of the value chain the branding, the marketing, and the design, because that's where they make their, it is by monopolizing these areas, some of it through intellectual property rights, and the other through things like uh, copyright and you know design name, brand names, etc. Therefore, they are able to earn a very high profit rate, and they would not like to share that knowledge or information with likely competitors. So that's an important point we need to make with regard to the upgrading and the enhancement of capabilities. The second point which I would make, which we, uh, which we, which came up in a study which we did of the garment and other industries. By the way, uh, Professor Sato says that there's a lot of concentration on automobiles and pharmaceuticals and IT, which is correct. But in fact, we've also done, there have been studies of the garment industry. And in fact, with my co-author, I've just completed one on the garment industry in India, which will come out in the, you know, the series that I co-edit for Cambridge University Press. It's called reverse subsidies. So why do we call it reverse subsidies? Our point is that in a value chain and in a global value chain, there is a monopsony relationship between the brand and the suppliers. And this monopsony relationship of brand and suppliers or manufacturers, if you want to put it that way, results in a majority of the profits being cornered by the brands who earn monopoly profits from their uh, property rights of different kinds, while the manufacturers only get the competitive profit rate. Now, this we found to be correct, even across sizes and types of technology used. We saw that with the uh, with the reduction in the lead times, you know, lead times have been falling with the advent of fast fashion. So now the lead times have gone down from the earlier 90 days, and they're often 45 or even 30 days. So lead times have gone down. And as a result of this fall in lead times, we saw two kinds of responses among the manufacturers. One, largely the small to medium ones, were became more labor exploitative. They used more overtime. They used more of cheap uh, contract labor. And therefore, they reduce their costs in this over exploitation of the labor force which they which they employed. The other, which are the large ones, uh, which became larger, are those who utilize technology, organize their production systems better, utilize more technology, more advanced technology. For instance, moved from hand embroidery to you know computerized machine embroidery and so on. So they also they actually they improved their technology. But the interesting th point we found is that the profit rates don't differ very much between the labor intensive or labor exploitative uh, units and the responders and the technology intensive responders. So which leads us to the conclusion, that's why we say this is a form of monopsony where the buyers are able to monopolize, uh, get the majority of the profit and the sellers are reduced to only getting the competitive rate of profit. The difference can be in the, the rate of profit, which we found in the garment industry over here is like nine to 10%, somewhere eight, somewhere 10, maybe 11, but not beyond 12 and not below eight, because below eight, you wouldn't even be able to remain in the industry. So these are the very low rates of profit because of the high level of monopsony. On the other hand, I just will uh, take a minute to compare it with say the IT industry, where India 
is not a, is is not in a position of being a anonymous supplier to the company you know fortune 500 companies for which they provide it services it computer it software services rather the top indian companies like tcs infosys etc all have very strong reputational assets and they are able to keep their margins at around 23 to 25 percent so that is very high and of course there's a medium rung like the smaller ones like the lnt or the Mahindra Tech, et cetera, who have margins around, well, 16, 17, 18%. But you should compare these two sets of margins, one around 25% for the top rank. Obviously, they're not in a monopsony position. They themselves have a certain monopoly power because of their uh, ability, because of their reputation. It's mainly their reputation that the TCS and Infosys have, and they're able to get a certain rate of return. While in garments, you will find that irrespective of the size, there is not much difference. There is some improvement, and there is some improvement in the condition of workers in the large units compared to the small, which I think Professor Sato also pointed out, that wages do go up and working conditions do improve in the large units, but they don't really make a transformational change. They still remain within the area of around the national minimum wage. It's just a little bit more, a little bit less. So it's really not very different. So I would just like to conclude by pointing out these two points. One is that the monopsony relations enable the brands, the buyers, the lead lead firms to get a, a major share of the profits out of the whole value chain, while the suppliers who are uh, many and therefore and competing between themselves and even between countries are only able to get the uh, competitive profits in that industry. Uh, thank you. I'll end my uh, comments with that. Thank you, Professor Devnathan. Now I would like to request uh, our second discussant, uh, Professor Amita, for a remark. Thank you, uh, Professor Nalin Bharti, for uh, giving me the opportunity to give my comments on Professor Sato's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, thank you also, Chair, uh, Professor Asher, uh, for your initial comments, the introductory comments. And, um, you know, I would like to point out a couple of, uh, you know, my, my comments are more in the sense of seeking clarifications from Professor Sato. Uh, first, of course, I'd like to uh, congratulate him on a very wide ranging, very comprehensive presentation that he's made across two parts, I would say, you know, uh, the overall macro perspective that he has given on global value chains and the second, which is both plant, which is more plant based micro uh, kind of analysis that he has undertaken. Uh, my comments are more in the nature of the first part because my own work uh, has been in terms of global value chains and trade policy, you know, uh, because ultimately, as far as global value chains are concerned, the impact is really seen in terms of a country's participation in global trade, you know. In that sense, I think I would draw an essential fundamental distinction between global value chains and domestic value chains, and I would in that context point out, you know, the difficulty that I have in comprehending the Professor Sato's putting the two together in one analysis, you know. There is a huge difference between how global value chains operate and how uh, firms or production units in an individual country participate in global value chains and how countries try to build complete domestic value chains in any sector, you know. So I think the analysis of the two in terms of productivity implications has to be drawn from very different concepts and very different strands of literature than combining the two and putting the two together in one analysis, you know. I don't think there is a comparison here, you know. Uh, from the literature, it is very clear, it is very evident that as far as global value chain participation is concerned, it's, uh, as I said, reflected in trade participation, but that's also, you know, for the purpose of specialization in smaller tasks that enables individual countries to enhance their productivity. Uh, have we in India, through our global value chain participation, I think you do point this out in your initial presentations, but somewhere along the line, this has not been carried forward in your paper. 
uh, do we really see in terms of those firms or those units that participate in global value chains to have enhanced their productivity? You know, that's my first question to you, you know. In the second question, the second fact that I'd like to point out in your analysis is, you know, that apart from this very broad uh, brush that you give to value chain participation, I do not wish to classify it as global value chain participation, as I said, drawing the distinction between domestic and global value chain participation, that's one. Two, um, the uh, time period that you take into account, you see, there are huge differences in the terms, uh, you know, in terms of the progress and evolution of global value chain structures over this period, you know, from the 1990s to the current, you know, that you have as your analysis reference period, uh, the global value chains have undergone a very, very distinctive change, particularly in the post-global financial. It's not really the post-global financial crisis period that you demarcate. It's really the 2011-12 after that, you know, the period that you see a clear restructuring and evolution of global value chains towards shorter lengths and towards regionalization in a way, you know, which, is get us, which has become more concentrated or which has become more accelerated in the wake of the US-China trade tensions, more so during the pandemic, it is expected. Let us see how it happens, you know. So as far as the pattern of evolution of global value chains is concerned, you know, I think you should have drawn a distinction between what happened before 2010-11, what has happened after that, and then beyond that, how is it that we're expecting things to be, you know. Uh, these distinctions are essential in terms of looking at individual country participation, because you also see alongside this a change in the participation of individual countries as far as global value chains are concerned. And I say this particularly with reference to two or three graphs that you've shown where you've drawn comparisons between ASEAN 5, China, India, Japan, and so on, you know. Uh, you know, one has to be very clear about the kind of distinctions that exist as far as these individual economies are concerned in terms and the nature of participation that they've had in global value chains. Uh, Southeast Asia has been a very active participant almost throughout the, uh, you know, throughout this phase of your analysis, you know, whether it's 1990s, uh, 2000s, and even now, you know. China, when you show a decline, you see China's decline is analyzed very, very differently relative to other countries' decline. You can't equate the two. There is a huge debate as far as China is concerned in terms of whether the decline in its value chain, in its global value chain participation is because of a greater intensification of its upgraded domestic value chains, you know. So, I mean, to club all of them together and to show that US is declining, China is declining, Japan is declining, I think there needs to be a nuanced explanation or a nuanced analysis to that before you club all of these uh, countries together and categorize them as one either declining or rising, you know. That's the other distinction that I uh, want to draw the attention of the audience to and yours as well, you know. A third thing that you say, you know, in terms of India's analysis, you know, being drawn, being more concentrated in automotives and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, I think as Professor Nathan has already pointed out, there is a lot of literature. In fact, there is more literature on textiles and garments uh, as far as textiles and apparel, textiles and garments in case of India and automobiles. These are two sectors that find a lot of analysis having been done because these are where India initially integrated in global value chains, you know. And again, I'd like to point out, you know, in terms of your data analysis, that the decline as far as, as, far as increase in India's participation is concerned, it did not end in 2008, as you point out, you see. The increase goes on almost up to 2012-13. It's only after that that we start to see a slight decline as far as India's global value chain participation is concerned. So I would, you know, I mean, if you can go through the data again and see uh, there is a very, very clear upward trend of India's value chain participation, global value chain participation in automobiles, uh, as well as in textiles and garments. And the decline happens only much later. This is also true to a certain extent in electronics where the, the, the change in the nature and direction of India's participation is not so clear because we continue to do so, as we've seen in more recent times with the kind of changes that have been brought about in the electronic sector, 
uh, particularly as far as the tariff structure in uh, the electronic structure, uh, electronic sector is concerned, as far as input tariffs are concerned. So um, my, uh, you know, my inputs here would be in terms of a relook, if you can take towards on uh, towards data in these sectors, you know. The other thing that I'd like to say here is, you know, that you have in, you know, the greater concentration on automobiles, textiles and garments and electronics as far as India's analysis is concerned is because this is where you find global value chains to be dominant. These are the three sectors that globally dominate as far as value chain uh, participation is concerned by all countries, you know. It's only natural, therefore, that we, as far as most of the studies in India are concerned, are also concentrated in this, you know. With regard to fuel and, you know, oil and lubricants, et cetera, being the dominant sector, I have to point out here again, you know, that while I think there is a connection issue with uh, Professor Batra. Nalin sir, shall we invite Mukul sir for his comments? Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, I will request Professor Asar for uh, his comment. And then uh, if, uh, if she will again come back, then she will also uh, finish her, her comment. So first of all, I will uh, uh, we we would like, like to have the comment from Professor Asar, and then uh, we'll wait for uh, Professor Amita's reentry. Professor Asar, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the, the presentation and the kind of research uh, that Sensei Sato has presented is so very typical of the research we associate with Japan, very detailed, meticulous, plant-based, industry-based, um, getting into uh, great details. And this is one area that we need to learn from and more and more research needs to be done on such a meticulous, uh, detailed basis. On the uh, global value chains, uh, one of the useful insights that Sensei can provide us is that recently India has taken a lot of initiatives with uh, the Atmanirbhar globalization, others, and very specifically to increase the global value chain participation. So this year, India is aiming for USD 400 billion in merchandise exports alone. And, and the uh, vision is to reach 1 trillion USD by the end of the decade. Now, the, this can't be done without much greater participation in the, in the global value chains, both ways, imports as well as exports uh, and technology. So what are the policy implications of the research that you have done uh, specifically for India. And if I may make a personal observation for India and Japan, one of the 
uh, positions which I hold is as chairman of the board of directors of Sumitomo Chemical India Private Limited. And we are in, in India uh, collaborating with Sumitomo Japan to try to get some of the R&D done in India, some of the products that Sumitomo is currently producing in Japan and elsewhere to be manufactured in India. And we have just bought a 50 acre land uh, in the H industrial area to try to give concrete shape to that. So the, uh, it would be useful then as to uh, getting down to the policy level, one area to explore, not just by sensei, but by Indian researchers is the India-Japan, which is a very strategic partnership as to how that global value chain can be increased. The other much larger uh, picture, which is just emerging, is that if we see a slowdown in, let's say, China's economic growth and therefore global economic growth in investment. We have already seen the uh, relationship between GDP and global trade, uh, which was about 1.5% before coming down towards one. What will be the implications of that on the global value chains in the future for selected countries. So that dynamic part, that research um, is very, very rich. And I hope it is something that can be, that can be uh, pursued uh, further. Okay, let me, let me just stop here uh, as we are running out of time. Yeah, so uh, Professor Amita, you were about to conclude your point. So can I again, again, uh, ask you to conclude your point? Yeah, just as a concluding point, uh, you know, something that has already been, um, I think, brought in by uh, Professor Asher is the manufacturing capability, you know, as has been stated, you know, that India is trying its Atmanirbharta, uh, you know, uh, as one of the objectives of Atmanirbharta, uh, you know, uh, policy or assignment that India has outlined for itself, it's very important that it participate or it increase its participation in global value chains, you know. My question to you, uh, Professor uh, Sato, is in these terms, you know, when you say that India's uh, participation has been high, relatively high in manufacturing, particularly in the fuel and lubricant sector, you know, that is the uh, petroleum, oil and oil, uh, petroleum, oil and uh, lubricant sector, that's petroleum and uh, refined petroleum products, you know, has it really led to any increase in manufacturing productivity and capabilities for India? Where you show that increase in wages for India, you know, is it associated with an increase in productivity in this sector, in general in manufacturing, in general in other sectors where value chain participation is seen in India? Or what, I mean, how do you associate productivity increase with value chain participation as far as India is concerned in the sectors that you are able to identify India's higher value chain participation? That relationship with which you start, I think, must also be brought in at some level uh, for India's participation in, uh, for India's value chain participation that you show in the manufacturing sector. I think I'll stop here and uh, look forward to your answers. Thank you, Nalin. Yeah, uh, Professor Sato, uh, now uh, I think uh, this is your time to, uh, to respond to the, some of the questions by the discussion. And then I will also take some of the questions from the other audience, uh, those who are joining this program from the Facebook Live. Uh, so first of all, Professor Sato, can you uh, respond to these questions which were asked by the discussion? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Devnathan. 
So I know that you will publish the very good uh, book, uh, mono, mono, eh, Monopsony, Monopsony Capitalism, CUP. So I very lucky to have uh, your statement on new book. <laughs> Thank you very much. So in GVC studies, uh, so many scholars uh, clarified uh, several type of the governance type, governance type, capture type, market type, uh, multinational companies type, uh, and uh, modular type, relational type. So I think uh, monopsony capitalism is also uh, regarded as some type of GVC governance. So maybe uh, it mono, monopsony type of uh, monopos, monopsony capitalism is one type of capture uh, governance type. Is, is it correct? I'm not sure. So I, I want to know that uh, some classification of the GVC concept and the concept of the uh, monopsony uh, capitalism. Very similar, co uh, similar concept, I think. And also, uh, today I uh, skip so many uh, existing studies on agro business and also uh, textile and garment industry. Still, GVC studies have. Uh, on India, uh, so many uh, papers, so many books on the garment sectors and uh, agribusiness sectors also. So, but the, uh, according to my data set, 50 papers and books, top three is uh, IT pharmaceutical automobiles. So next uh, four and five is agro, agri, agro, agro business and uh, uh, textile and garment sectors. This is a this is a due to the my data set. So thank, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So the De, Professor Devnathan raised so many important uh, points. Thank you very much. And, uh, Professor Batora, Professor Batora. So thank you very much for your comments and uh, questions. So I. Uh, neglect so many nuanced phenomena, uh, especially in the recent period, after especially the under Modi, Narendra Modi registration. So after Narendra Modi registration, uh, I think uh, Make India campaign uh, strongly uh, promoted. So after that, the uh, increase in tariff rate, especially the uh, some footwear's tariff rate, huge increase. <laughs> Labor intensive and low tech industry, especially the uh, goods uh, in which the many uh, small companies uh, has uh, conducted, engaged in the very labor intensive with low technology. In such kind of the uh, low tech uh, labor intensive industry, uh, the tariff rate huge increased. <laughs> so this is also the part of the Make Indian campaign. So and also Make Indian campaign promote the uh, Make in India of the smartphone and some uh, electronic electronics equipment. So I think these kind of the. Uh, 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 tariff rate has some uh, impact of the industrial structure and the pattern of the GBC participation of each firms and each industries. Today, I skip uh, these aspects, including the self-reliant India program, uh, production linked incentive scheme programs. Today, I skip. So now, so many uh, incentive schemes, so many uh, uh, trade policies uh, have some impact. So today I cannot uh, give some con concrete evidence uh, for this. So next time I try to show the uh, 
uh, this kind of the uh, phenomena. And also, uh, in the other part of the, my research subject, I study the impact of calling direct investment. And also, I study the impact of the reduction of the tariff rate by using the data set from the annual survey of industries. So this uh, research uh, line is based on the uh, standard international economic analysis. So on this time, I skip all of my existing uh, research result based on the standard international economic analysis. So uh, from my uh, ongoing research subject, especially the de de uh, reduction of the uh, import uh, tariff, especially of intermediate goods, these type of the reduction of the tariff rate increase total factor productivity in the India manufacture sectors. And also uh, foreign direct investment, especially the backward effect of FDI spillover effect has positive impact of the total factor productivity of Indian manufacturing sectors. So I conducted uh, such kind of the standard economic analysis also. Next time I share the, my uh, research uh, result with you, <laughs> if I have some chance to interact with you. This is okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So, and the pro Professor Ashore, Ashur, Professor Ashore, uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind of comment. I also conducted the uh, economic activity of Japanese uh, affiliated multinational companies working in India with Narin Baruti. So maybe within uh, one year, we will uh, publish one uh, long papers, discussion papers on the economic activity of Japanese affiliated multinational company working in India by using uh, unit level data of uh, Japanese government conducted survey, overseas business activity survey from 1995 to 2018. For last, uh, last 22, uh, we, we will examine that. How, how that change the behavior of the Japanese multinational companies working in India. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sato. We have two questions uh, yes. related to your talk. Uh, so the first question in the, in the, uh, 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 in the chat box and also in the question and answer uh, uh, boxes, please share your views on the need for enhancing digital connectivity post pandemic for trade and GVC. Yeah, this is a very important uh, yeah. question. Current situation. <laughs> so I always uh, keen to know that progress of the digitization of India. Narendra Modi administration started to digital India and uh, they pushed the very uh, nice uh, program on for improving the digitization. Uh, so especially I am very interested in the other uh, JAM program, uh, Jandan Adar Mobile. Jump program for direct income transfer to the vulnerable sections in the, in the society. And also, I am very keen to uh, fintech, fintech technology, especially uh, uh, based on the other uh, the Indian government started to set up the Indian stack. Indian stack is a platform for interacting the each uh, financial company uh, engaged in the something uh, in, with, be, based on the Indian stock. So my uh, personal friend uh, involved in the uh, construction of the 
and the uh, utiliz utilization of the Indian stack. So, uh, okay, so, so this kind of the uh, digitization of India is very, very important for understanding the uh, structural change of the GVC governance and structural change of the GVC pattern. If we uh, start to understand the decent uh, situation uh, of the uh, digitized, uh, digitization of the, in the world, so India is most advanced <laughs> uh, countries, I think. For example, the, we now we have the uh, PayPay, P-A-Y, P-A-Y. This is a digital uh, mobile, digital mobile home uh, payment system. Originally, this PayPay uh, is originated in the Paytm. So we adopt, now we, Japan, Japan, adopt the very advanced technology from India, Paytm, from Paytm. My wife, every day, uses the PayPay. <laughs> this is the Indian, uh, Japanese version of the Paytm. So this is a very new one. So I, I appreciate this kind of the uh, advanced, ad, advanced uh, progress in the digitization in the world, as well as in India. But this is okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Professor Sato, we have one more question uh, yes. related to the social network. And the person is asking about the over dependence of the world, including business on social uh, network platforms, led to huge losses on GVC. What should be the way forward <laughs> in dealing with such challenges in future? I'm not sure. Uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn social network system make some contribution to making some business uh, network. Not only uh, time consuming <laughs> activity. Maybe Twitter, Twitter, Twitter and WhatsApp uh, may be uh, time consuming, but the Facebook and the LinkedIn have some positive <laughs> contribution to improve the business condition and information, uh, fill the some gap of the information across the uh, countries. Now we are, we are very easy to access to the some important person by using the uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, one last question is related to uh, the current uh, coal crisis. So the participant is writing that uh, it will be a difficult time for uh, managing the, uh, the production yeah. in India and how Indian industry will try to uh, come out from such crisis. Yeah, it is very difficult uh, situation. We Japanese also face the same uh, problems. COP26 just will start uh, this week, COP26. So in the COP26 agenda, the green technology, no carbon neutral. So uh, especially EU, EU start to stop the uh, utilization of the coal for making the electricity. So, and China uh, also started to close uh, mining uh, companies, uh, coal, coal mining companies. So these kind of the uh, carbon neutral uh, policy and uh, also Green New Deal policy uh, based by the uh, Biden, US Biden administration. These kind of the uh, worldwide a policy change towards the green technology, carbon neutral technology, green new deal uh, program uh, induced uh, current coal crisis. So this is a very uh, difficult situation. Personally, I prefer that still uh, India uh, energy sector need uh, coal as a material for 
e e making the electricity. So these are very difficult questions. And uh, this is not only the Indian problems, but also the worldwide problem. <laughs> It is very difficult. So uh, now I will uh, request both the discussion for two minutes way forward, uh, based on the presentation of Professor Sato. Both the discussions are now invited for two minutes way forward remark. So Professor Devnathan. Okay, just two points with regard to the way forward. One is for Indian manufacturing to become more competitive, to be able to increase its productivity in order to be better, uh, participate better in value chains. As I mentioned, it will not, it may not lead to an increase in profit rates, but volumes can go up. So if you want to become a big player in the value chain, area you need to have more productive uh, investments uh, more more productive manufacturing which requires not only better infrastructure etc which india is notorious for infrastructure but it also requires well a, a way of doing business that is not so bureaucratic i mean we still have despite all the talk about how we're going to digitize everything we still have a very bureaucratic system of managing finances, where I've heard many garment manufacturers complain about how difficult it is for them to get GST reimbursements after they have paid GST. So those kind of things don't help. Along with that, we need much better labor policies because it's not just a matter of thinking that with cheap labor, I mean, there seems to be an idea that because Indian labor is cheap, our wage rates are low, so we can get any part of the world manufacturing value chain uh, to be settled in India. That's not so. That will not happen. That's why we don't see that there is a big role of India in, say, garment manufacturer, where actually India's share of garment manufacturer has been falling. Similarly, also in leather and uh, leather products, where also our share is not increasing. And certainly with all the big turmoils we've had with regard to the entire leather value chain, it's becoming more and more difficult. And in fact, people are shifting their orders to Bangladesh and other countries rather than giving them in India. So there's a big need to be able to increase the uh, to, to be able to increase the productivity levels, which requires much better in um, much larger proportions of permanent workers with much better conditions of labor and working. That's the main point I would like to make. Secondly, we also need to see how to develop technology because it, it is the, as I mentioned, it is the technology firm, it is the where you have a monopoly of the brand and the technology that you're able to get a higher share of the profits in the way that China has been able to do. We do not see many Indian uh, lead firms developing in that manner. We do have some. We have Tata's, Mahindra's, and a few others, but we don't have it to the extent that China has developed it. So if you want to go up in the value chain, in the, in the global value chain, you really need to go from beyond manufacturing to the design and the development of technology itself. Thank you. So now I will request Professor Amita for her uh, two minutes way forward. Yeah, uh, my two very brief points. One of course is, uh, uh, I'd like to put it the other way around, you know, that as far as enhancing manufacturing productivity is concerned, both for enhancing manufacturing productivity as well as for employment, India really needs to integrate with global value chains. At present, our global value chain participation is very low, particularly when it comes to the backward labor, low skill labor intensive linkages in labor intensive sectors, you know. And these, as I quoted earlier, you know, are in terms of electronics, uh, automotives, as well as garments and uh, apparel, where garments and apparel in particular, where we had an increasing share earlier, we've lost the share post 2010 in global exports, you know. So we need to recover and the way to recover, I mean, as far as increasing our participation in global value chains is concerned, Two points that I'd like to make, which I've been writing repeatedly in my, uh, you know, um, you know, larger press columns, you know, as far as open columns and uh, print media are concerned, 
is one to have a conducive other than what uh, professor nathan has stated as logistics ease of doing business etc very fundamentally we need to bring about or have a conducive trade policy you know uh, one is in terms of changing our tariff structure where in the last few years we've done a reversal in terms of increasing our import tariffs on some of the intermediate commodities in these very important sectors and two is to integrate better with a more dynamic region you know which is uh, southeast asia east asia where we have lost the opportunity as far as uh, you know the regional com comprehensive economic partnership is concerned but i hope we can make it up through a better revision that is under review the a better review that is already underway of the india asean fta probably try and participate also in the cptpp if we can upgrade our standards to that level but i think regional trade agreements regional trade integration and a conducive trade policy is absolutely essential for india to enhance its gvc participation which underlies our uh, ability to enhance our manufacturing productivity i'll stop here thank you thank you now uh, professor sato for his uh, way forward remark Uh, thank you very much for a uh, very nice introduction with many uh, Indian scholars. So I appreciate the comments and the questions from Professor uh, Ashu and Professor Devnathan and Professor Anita Batora. So thank you very much. So I personally, I hope that uh, if you are okay, I uh, want to uh, keep touch with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I will request Professor uh, Professor Asher for uh, his remarks. So please unmute yourself, Professor Asher. Uh, Thank you, Nalin. Uh, I've already indicated what I wanted to say, so no, no more comments. Yeah, so uh, let me uh, conclude the entire discussion. So I found that uh, the presentation by Professor Sato highlighted that uh, in terms of India's participation in GBC, uh, the the participation rate of india is not uh, uh, very high compared to other countries but at the same time uh, we can also uh, see that there are few sectors where india's participation is growing uh, with with a little better speed uh, so many points which was raised by devnathan in terms of uh, labor policy reform uh, or the questions which which was raised by Uh, some of the audience in terms of uh, the coal crisis so uh, all these all these factors are basically making us aware that whatever op opportunity india is having these opportunity cannot be uh, captured these opportunity will be completely unbound if uh, certain reforms in terms of policy and certain precautions in terms of inputs has not been done so Uh, there is there is a fact that kaleidoscopic competitive advantage uh, is in the hand of india and uh, uh, there are many other asian countries which are also ready to compete with india in terms of textile and in other sectors also so india cannot be uh, a, a sleeping ele elephant uh, considering the potential of many smaller countries uh, nearby and many uh, countries uh, Uh, are in the position to compete, including Bangladesh, as it was highlighted by Devnatha. So uh, this is the first uh, uh, point which uh, I would like to uh, highlight that it is having the potential, but uh, such potentials has to be again, uh, again, uh, bound enough for making India more better uh, in terms of uh, providing employment, having more economic growth, faster growth. and to make india more bigger size of the economy in future uh, associating this point with another point which which is having in my mind and for which professor asar has somehow uh, 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 somehow linked uh, through his uh, uh, through his remarks that whenever it it comes for 
the production global value chain, uh, we are finding some of the destinations where we have the cost efficiency, where we can have the low cost of production. But at the same time, uh, the host country should not forget that uh, instead of becoming only manufacturing hub, we can also try to work on becoming knowledge hub. It's not only to, to have the production as a part of our Nirbhar Bharat. It is also true that uh, apart from doing manufacturing uh, offshore for other farms in India and participating in the global value chain, we should not miss the most important fact that if we have to go ahead, if we have to reach to a, a better uh, economic indicators, we have to also have more patent applications filed, more copyright, more industrial designs, more integrated circuits produced. So as long as India is not in the position to produce intellectual property rights product, uh, we will be only known as the, uh, as the, you can say, manufacturer uh, for others. But if we have to become manufacturer, manufacturing uh, brand, if we have to become a leader in the manufacturing, we cannot forget that we have another task also on our table, and that is to produce intellectual property products. So with this, with, with this remark, uh, I would like to just conclude and congratulate Professor Sato for this very timely, wonderful, and very deep analyzed presentation on this issue and India's participation in this global value chain. Uh, thank you, Impri, for uh, making us, uh, giving us this opportunity to reconnect uh, uh, on, this, on this topic. People from Japan, uh, Singapore, and India are now here on, on a single platform. And I hope that in future also, we will have such opportunities to, to have uh, much better interaction uh, uh, for, for such timely talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So to give a formal vote of thanks, I invite Dr. Sinimata. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Bharti. I totally echo your uh, comments and congratulations to all our uh, esteemed panelists. So um, I would really like to thank uh, uh, the speaker for today, Professor Takahiro Sato, um, and our esteemed panelists, uh, Professor uh, Mukul Asher, Professor Devnathan, and Professor Amita Batra, and uh, your own participation, sir, uh, Professor Nalin Bharti. Uh, in, in fact, the whole deliberation really uh, enhanced the uh, understanding about the global value chain participation and uh, the role of India in it. So I'm so grateful. On behalf of IMPRI Center for the Study of Finance and Economics, I thank each one of you um, for, for your sparing your time and for uh, sparing your knowledge and sharing it with all of us. And uh, I also mm -hmm. extend my thanks to, and gratitude to all our audience who joined us here on phase on uh, Zoom and on Facebook Live, and to all those who would be watching us later on uh, YouTube and also listening to us on our podcasts. So thank you, and I wish that we will be able to meet and uh, discuss about this uh, soon. And I wish you all a very good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Sato. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sato and all. Ah, yes, uh, Professor Amita. No. Professor <laughs> Dev. Dr. Raj. Yeah.